You guys have been doing way too much sitting today, so could you all just stand up really quickly and just high five the person closest to you? All right. So I think that we are all alive right now in the most exciting time in history, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit why I think that. Go ahead, sit down. Um, so I'm going to talk about human intelligence, and I'm going to talk about robots, uh, and what I think the future is going to look like. Um, first, a little bit about me and the company I come from. Um, Vicarious is a seven-year-old company, um, and we work on artificial intelligence. We're fortunate enough to be funded by about $120 million from some of my personal heroes and some great venture funds and also some amazing companies like Samsung. Uh, and the best way to understand what it is that we're working on and what I think the future holds for AI and robots is this totally bizarre paradox that you and I and everyone are living in right now, which is that the world is full of really cheap robot parts like motors and plastics and metal and electricity and sensors and nobody owns any robots. If you look at a factory 100 years ago and a factory right now, uh, not a lot's changed. We pay people billions of dollars a year to pick up things in one box and put them in a different box. And then we pay them billions more to pick up objects out of boxes and put them on shelves. And then trillions to pick up objects in one bin and put them on other objects. And then trillions more after that and trillions more after that. And this is so far from the future that I thought I was going to be living in. And I think maybe all of us thought we were going to be living in when we were 10 years old. We thought that we would have general purpose robots that could do all kinds of different stuff without being hand programmed to do each task one at a time. Uh, and from a hardware perspective anyway, uh, we already have robots like this. We've had robots like this for 10 years. This is a, a video from over a decade ago of basically Rosie. Um, and the trick of this video is the robot is being controlled by a human. So. As long as you have a human brain in the loop, you can do almost anything you want with a robot. I think if I forced you to live your everyday life using a normal robot gripper like that one, I think you could do pretty much most of what you do during your daily routine using a robot part. And so effectively, we're actually already living in this Jetsons-like future. Uh, we just lack the AI layer necessary to fill the world with billions of robots. And that is what we're working on at Vicarious. Um, I think uh, every interesting company exists to make a prediction come true. Uh, and the prediction that I'd like Vicarious to make come true is in 15 years, uh, I'd like there to be more robots than cell phones. I'd like robots to be as ubiquitous and as inexpensive as cell phones. Um, and, and to get there, I think that we need a really different way of thinking about intelligence than, um, than is currently sort of the mainstay focus in, in a lot of the research communities. Uh, I think there's actually a really interesting parallel between the evolution of artificial intelligence and the evolution of animal intelligence. Um, so if we go back 600 million years, we get the very first uh, intelligent animals, things like uh, sponges and jellyfish. And as time passes, uh, the animals get more complicated, but I would argue they don't get any smarter. It's just deeper layers of simple reflexive behaviors. And then uh, in the neuroscience world, we call these kinds of behaviors based on the old brain. It's all about instinct, it's about stimulus and response. And about 100 million years ago, evolution figured out a radically different architecture for intelligence. Uh, and in the neuroscience world, we call this the new brain. It's what gave us ourselves and whales and dolphins and primates. And instead of being about stimulus and response, it's about why and what if. It's about causal reasoning, it's about mental simulation, it's about imagination. And I'm gonna to argue today that deep learning predominantly is in this big yellow box. And to get to that world full of billions of robots, we need to shift architectures in the same way that evolution did. So I'll give you some examples. Um, the old brain in animals is awesome. And just like deep learning is also awesome, it's capable of doing all kinds of really cool things. So. You know, the old brain can hunt for food, it can navigate environments, it can reproduce, um, but it has a couple of limitations that are important to keep in mind. Um, to make an old brain animal, you need a lot of training data. You need a couple hundred million years of training data. And the resulting animal 
is not going to generalize well to new environments or new tasks. And it also isn't going to have a model of the world of, of itself, of what it's doing. Uh, it's going to give the illusion of intelligence without actually being smart in the way you and I think about being smart. Um, and it has this kind of architecture to it where a stimulus comes in, whether it's a, a picture or a, a, a sound, and the animal has some trained heuristics inside it, and then it takes an action. Um, and that is, um, if it goes wrong in a bunch of ways. So these are baby geese. Uh, and baby geese make this noise. And scientists found that mother geese will actually love and care for anything that makes that noise. So you can take a tape recorder that plays that sound and put it inside of a taxidermy of a wolf and the mother goose will love and care for the wolf as if it's one of its children uh, until the tape recorder runs out of batteries and then she'll peck it to shreds. Um, or similarly, these are baby ducks and baby ducks believe the first thing they see when they're born is their mom. And these ducklings happen to see a dog when they were born. And so now they follow the dog everywhere thinking it's their mom. Um, and similarly, frogs in their brains have this simple circuit that says fire the tongue whenever you see this pixel pattern. So the frog will actually starve itself to death in front of an iPhone because it's just following this very simple set of heuristics. Um, and it's remarkably similar to what you see in today's AIs, where you have AI systems that give the appearance of intelligence. Um, you know, they, they can play Atari games, they can play Go, they can control robots. Uh, there's all these really interesting behaviors that we see from deep learning, um, but it actually has the same limitations as the old brain. Uh, it takes lots of training data to make a deep learning system work, and the resulting system you get out doesn't really understand what it's doing uh, and doesn't generalize well to new tasks. Um, and it even has the same architecture. Uh, and it actually goes wrong in a lot of the same ways that our old brain ancestors uh, go wrong. So as, a, as an example, um, this is uh, the famous Google DeepMind uh, Atari playing AI, um, playing a, a brick breaking game here. And it was trained to play this game, and you and I, when we watch it play, we say, okay, it's moving the paddle to hit the ball to try and hit, hit bricks. But that's the story we make up as intelligent people about what it's doing. Uh, and what it's really doing is much more like the frog. Uh, and you can reveal that if you just make the game 2% brighter, it does this instead. And you can see this kind of behavior everywhere in deep learning once you start to look for it. Um, the AlphaGo uh, uh, demonstration that Google gave not too long ago um, it was kind of interesting because in order to play Go as well as a 30-something-year-old as a, as a year old human, um, it needed the equivalent of about 3,000 years of continuous play training time. So a, lo a lot more data than a human needed. And the resulting system, I wouldn't even say that it can actually play Go because if you look at the picture of the challenge match, there's this guy who has to sit here and pick up the pieces and put them on the board for AlphaGo. Which isn't to say that deep learning can't control robot arms, it can. This is an experiment from Google X called the Arm Farm. But to have a, a robot arm that can pick up objects that are all roughly the same size 60% of the time, it takes about 800,000 practice grasps, which means these robot arms running continuously for months in order to be able to just pick up these objects. Um, and when it succeeds, it succeeds in a way that I wouldn't really call success. Like this is not the plan you and I would make if we were trying to pick something up. And it happens to work in this case. Um, but it doesn't really have a model of the world. And that's because deep learning is doing something that's very similar to fancy regression. Uh, I don't know how many people here have taken a stats class, but um, that's effectively what's going on inside the black box of deep learning. And um, so if you train a deep learning system with lots of pictures of cars and you give it a new one, like this picture, it'll say, oh, that's a car. But if you give it something like this, it'll say that's a bedroom pillow, whereas it's not going to fool you, you or I at all. And it's kind of amazing how small the changes need to be in order for deep learning to become confused. Like this is a, a bus, a deep learning system would say with 97% confidence, but you can actually just change a couple of pixels and it will start thinking that it's, a, it's an ostrich. Um, and then the pixels you have to change are imperceptible practically to you and me. And you can do this to anything. You can make it think anything's an ostrich. And this is just a, a property of doing regression. Um, so anyway, these are the properties of deep learning. These are very similar to the old brain and, and they're good at some things, but they're not good at everything. Um, and to get to that world where we have billions of robots, we really need to switch models to something that can learn causality and can understand um, how to control itself in a changing environment and move away from sort of frog-like systems. Um, and so that means shifting to something that works like your brain and mine. Um, and I'll give you some examples from the animal kingdom that kind of capture this, these sets of behaviors that I really like. Um, so. Whales in captivity are 
trained to pick up trash in their tanks and trade it with a trainer for fish. And one day a seagull died and fell into the tank and uh, the whale brought it to the trainer and instead of getting one fish as a reward, it got two fish because it was like a big object or something. Uh, and you imagine a frog would just eat both fish and that would be that. That's not what the whale did. The whale did this with the second fish. And it repeated that over and over again and built a stockpile of fish at the bottom of the tank. And then it used those fish to train all the other whales how to participate in the seagull for fish economy. <laughs> My other favorite example of this kind of behavior is uh, this is Coco the gorilla. Coco was raised in captivity and, and her favorite thing to do was watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which is this American children's show. And Mr. Rogers uh, found out that Coco was a fan of his show. And so he went to visit her at the zoo. And the first thing that Coco wanted to do with him when they met at the zoo was help him take off his shoes because that's how he always started his show. All right, my last favorite example from mammals comes from uh, an 18 month old human. Now this is an 18 month old in an environment it's never been in before, looking at objects it's never seen before, watching a human it's never met before do an action it's never seen anyone do before without being given any explicit instructions. And this is what happens. So the reason why humans and other mammals can exhibit these amazing behaviors around adaptation and planning and generalization is because we have this radically different circuit in our brains than our old brain ancestors. We actually still have the old brain, the reptile brain, it's down here, it controls our blood pressure and our immune system. But on top of it, we have this new circuit called the neocortex. And it is responsible for all of our perception, all of our planning, uh, all of the things you think about as being cognition, language, motor actions. Um, and it's the same architecture across mammals. It's a, a replicated circuit, and that circuit is the key to building intelligent systems and intelligent robots that work like you and I. And it actually, it has the inverse characteristics um, of deep learning. It, it takes very little training data, it generalizes incredibly well to new environment, and it learns this causal model of the world. So instead of having a, you know, a narrow black box uh, that is indecipherable, you can actually, uh, look at it inside what is going on in the brain and say, okay, this is what I'm seeing and this is why I'm seeing that. And these are missing pieces of information. And you can imagine what if or why, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so that's what we've been working on at Vicarious. Uh, I can give you some examples of recent work we published um, and sort of talk about how, what's going on behind the scenes. So this is uh, some work from us uh, next to DeepMind's Atari player. We're both playing the same game. Um, and it, it looks pretty similar on the surface of it, but what's under the hood is what matters. So when you make uh, small changes, like for example, move the paddle up from where the agent thinks it's supposed to be, this is kind of analogous to a calibration error in a robot, um, uh, you and I and our AIs are able to just adjust and keep on playing. Whereas deep learning systems have a lot of trouble with this kind of thing uh, because they're just regressing. Or uh, if, you, if you watch what happens at the end of a game, the deep learning system, because it doesn't have a model of cause and effect, it can't make long-term plans about how to aim for hitting that one last brick. I'm not going to make you watch this whole video because it's about 15 minutes long of it bouncing around randomly. Uh, whereas when you and I play a game and when our, our, our AI systems play games like this, we make explicit plans and we move just enough to hit the ball where we want it to go uh, so that we can win. Um, and similarly, you can do all kinds of things to change the environment and, 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 and reveal this phenomenon where the deep learning agent uh, just, when we added a wall to the middle of the play field, it just hits the ball back and forth against the wall. Whereas uh, our system can notice the wall and uh, dynamically adjust its plans uh, and uh, plan around it. And this is without being trained explicitly with having a wall there. Um, much in the same way that you and I aren't trained on every possible configuration of walls and balls and games and so on. Um, <clears throat> we can even do really crazy things like create variations of these games where there's lots and lots of moving obstacles that are uh, blocking the, the, the path to the points. And to play a game like this one, you, uh, you really need to think very carefully about where you're going to hit it. 
to make sure that you can thread it exactly between all the obstacles. And um, that's just what our system does. Um, I'm gonna show you another version of this, um, but the next one I show you, the screen is gonna turn white. And while the screen is white, the game is actually paused. And what you're watching is our AI's imagination of all the possible futures it could live in. And after it sees all of them, it decides, I like to live in this one, because that's one where I score some points. And then it makes them the motor action choices required in order to do that. And it, it's learning all the dynamics of the game in order to have this mental simulation, just like you can close your eyes and imagine walking back to your car or driving to the airport or, eat, or making an ice cream sundae. Having a mental model of the world is a really powerful thing because it lets you adapt and plan. So this is what it looks like inside the brain of the vicarious agent here. It's kind of hypnotic, really. Um, we can also, because our systems don't rely on huge amounts of training data, we can do things like show our, our, our system a single example of a household object in the same way I could show you any of these objects and then ask you to manipulate them or recognize them from different angles. In fact, with just one training example, our system is able to recognize and finally segment these kinds of objects with 50 degrees of 3D rotation invariance. And then we can take these same objects or others and put them in industrial environments where we have robots that manipulate them. Which brings us back to this prediction that I'd really like to make come true uh, of getting to a future where there are more robots and cell phones. Um, I think that the future is pretty clear in just two charts. Uh, if you look at the trajectory of minimum wage and the price of a robot over time, um, you, you can kind of tell where we're going. And I, I think the price of the robot actually has a lot of room to go even lower because I don't know if you knew this, but most robots today don't come with cameras or don't use cameras. They were designed to operate for 50,000 hours continuously and move the end effector, the robot's gripper, to any point in 3D space within two tenths of a millimeter. And so to have a, a mechanical contraption that can do that reliably means you need to spend an insane amount of money on very, very expensive parts. And by adding a layer of intelligence, like you saw in the earlier videos of human-controlled robots, you don't need such expensive parts. And so you can drive robots from being something that are very bespoke and very expensive into something that's much more on the scale of consumer electronics. I actually think there's a lot of really interesting parallels between robots right now and computers in 1950. Uh, in, if you wanted a computer to do something in 1950, you went out and you hired an engineering firm and you gave them an RFP and they built you a completely bespoke system that only ever did the one thing you specified you wanted your computer to do. And there weren't a whole lot of computers in the world. And Robots today are the same way, where if you want a robot to do something, you go out and you hire a firm to build you a very bespoke system, and it's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it's going to take six months or a year for them to build it for you. And I think the future of robots looks a lot like the present of computing, where in the future, robots are inexpensive things you see everywhere, uh, and they have general purpose hardware, and they run intelligent software that lets them accomplish whatever tasks that they're physically capable of. Um, I see a an economic chain reaction that's already going on, and I think it'll, it'll keep getting faster, where as robots get less expensive and more affordable, more people buy them, which makes them less expensive and more affordable and so on and so forth, uh, until we get to that world where there are billions of robots. Um, I think that the, the amazing thing and the reason why I'm so excited about the work that we're doing is that humanity has built the whole world, including the room that we're sitting in and all the chairs we're sitting on, using two arms, two eyes, and a brain. And I'd like to see robots that can do the same thing. So thanks for listening.